welcome. Um, this is actually a session of my class, EE47. Um, but actually, um, it's, it's, this particular session of class is uh, co-hosted by Room 36 in the Play Lab um, because we have a fabulous guest speaker that we thought a lot more people would be interested in, and that's Nathan Seidel. Uh, Nathan is the CEO and founder of SparkFun. Once, very recently, he was an undergraduate uh, in engineering, just like you guys, just like many of you. And then he had this realization that it's actually hard to get the parts you want. And is that pretty much what caused the block to come into Just like that? That's, uh, there was a void, and uh, this monster was grown out of it. Yeah. So. Uh, last year, I, I realized that we would probably be at Maker Fair, and I could hijack. Maker Fair to get like a really great guest speaker for the class, and so we had that privilege once again. <coughs> Some of you guys had the chance to go to Maker Fair this last weekend. Yeah. 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 Um, great. So. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, if you've never heard of Spark Fun, this is what we're going to be talking about. So uh, these are about. Uh, this is kind of about me. So I started Spark Fun in, in a bedroom uh, about nine years ago. And that's interesting because I wasn't yet graduated from college. I was a junior in college operating out of a bedroom. It wasn't quite a dorm room, but pretty close, right? And I, that's me with the, the red hair sitting on a crew team. Uh, so what college taught me was uh, time management, right? I was, I was rowing on the crew team. I was taking, I don't know how many credit hours of engineering classes. I started this weird thing in my bedroom that kept growing and growing. And I was also a motorcycle mechanic. Right? I had to pay the bills. That was my real job, and SparkFun was just something else. And when I graduated from CU, I re realized that all I had to do was work. That's actually, I, I can actually do that. There's, <laughs> I'm going to have some free time. This is going to be good. So I was on the, the crew team. I was an RA in the dorms. I took a, my semester abroad. It was kind of sad. It was in Utah. Um, <laughs> I, I took a semester off in 2002 and worked at the Salt Lake City Olympics. That was a lot of fun. And I'm currently 30. I come from Oklahoma. And there's nobody else in my family that really does business, so what this means is that um, I don't know a lot of things. <laughs> so you come out of college and they've taught you a lot of things. They've taught you that sort of green slice. And, you know, I, I know some stuff that I don't know. I don't know a lot about law. I don't know a lot about finance. Uh, but that's not the stuff you got to watch out for. It's when you get a cease and desist from Spark International, right? A gigantic company owned by Fujitsu and Oracle. Right? Those guys are not to be messed around with, that you realize that it's the red stuff that'll get you. <laughs> so every day that I go into SparkFun, my goal is to try to not, not know more stuff, but to try to reduce the stuff that I don't know I don't know. So that's, that's the challenge that I've had for the past nine years, and hopefully I can share some of that with you today. This is what my desk looked like in 2002. So I was a sophomore in college. Um, one of the uh, upsides, downsides, however you look at it, to engineering is at this point in time, uh, they taught me a lot about transistors and a lot about like, notch filters and how to calculate all this stuff, but they didn't teach me how to plug something into a breadboard. So in my free time, I was plugging stuff into a breadboard, and this is a PIC microcontroller attached to an EEPROM, and that was a GPS module. This is, ladies and gentlemen, what a GPS data logger looks like in 2002, 10 years ago. How easily can we put this together today? This is the state of electronics, um, and that's a, that's a PIC programmer, and what I was doing is I was sort of uh, doing code, and then I hit a uh, program, and it would load it on this programmer, and then the programmer over ISP would push it on the microcontroller. And it's great, I was moving the programmer around, and you can see these bits of wire on my desk. Guess what happens when you move the programmer onto some exposed bits of wire? There was a spark and a little bit of smoke, and I fried the thing that cost me $150. Well, I, uh, I had a lot of student loans in college. I had a lot of work, that's how I was putting myself through college. So I didn't have the money for a $150 programmer, and when I burned it up, I certainly didn't have the money for a second one. So what do you do with no money? You jump on the internet in 2002 and start looking for a new programmer, and I kept coming across this website called Olamex, and it still looks this way today. Do you guys, <laughs> do, do you guys program in frames? It's all the rage. Um, so, they have this website, and they keep popping up as uh, this great programmer. This program is $35, right, versus $150. This thing is great. This is going to be the solution to all my problems. So I look at the web page, and I say, hey, where's the add to cart button? It's not there. Well, OK. And so you kind of dig around their website, and you have to send them an email. You say, hey, I'd like to buy this programmer. They email you back, and they say, oh, no problem. It's going to be $35 plus $17 in airmail 
please fill out this form and fax it back to us. <laughs> okay, well, it turns out Bolomex is located in Bulgaria. Right? I don't know about you, but I don't know how to fax anything to Bulgaria, and I'm not really comfortable with that either. <laughs> so, so in 2002, it was kind of obvious that something needed to change. This was the best website out there, and look at how bad it was. Um, there were some other websites as well. Um, Mauser and Digikey were very, very good companies, but how they got onto the internet. If, if, if you've seen a Digikey catalog and a Mauser catalog, I think in 1999 they took a, a bandsaw, cut the end off of it, and just scanned it in and called <laughs> that their website. Right? If you looked at the websites back then, there were no pictures, there were no data sheets. It was very difficult to kind of figure out what you were doing if you didn't have prior knowledge. So I said in 2002, if I'm having this issue, if I need these boards, maybe I'll order some extra and sell them to my friends in Colorado. Right? I, it, it'll be cool. I'll, I will subsidize my addiction by selling the drugs to my other friends. <laughs> so um, in 2002, registered sparkfun.com and uh, started putting a website together and uh, taking photographs of stuff. So again, there's a lot of stuff I don't know, and I don't know how to run a business, so I literally went to the bookstore and bought business plans for dummies. <laughs> Read through it, and it told me that I needed to raise financing in some way. I said, well, okay, there's a whole chapter on angel investors and venture capital and equipment loans and government financing. And all of that is great, but it takes a lot of paperwork, and it, a lot of conversations, and a lot of handshaking, and I don't know about you, but I'd rather, I'm an introvert. I'd rather work on projects than talk to people. And so in, in 2002, I said, well, I've got this credit card in my pocket. I wonder how much trouble I can get into with that. <laughs> so in 2002, it was actually a pretty good limiter, right? Because if you had a million dollars worth of VC, you can really get yourself into a lot of trouble. Where if you have a limiter like a credit card, it, 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 it's a, a nice, nice way to limit it. So uh, $2,500 is what SparkFun started on, on credit card debt. So I bought some inventory. With the, I bought some parts from Rolex. I bought a shelf for my bedroom. I bought a tape gun, and I bought a piece of canvas. The piece of canvas was for the photos. So in 2002, Amazon was kicking, online shopping was common, but for electronics, you would get a photograph of the front of the electronics, and it's usually like a thumbnail, something really small. And no one figured out that some of us, I don't know about you guys, but I like to see the front of the thing I'm ordering, the back of the thing I'm ordering, maybe, for instance, a quarter <coughs> next to it. Something there for scale, something so that you can tell how big this stuff is, because nowadays the chips are so stinking small, or, or screws, or connectors, or anything. Uh, uh, how many times have you guys accidentally ordered the wrong uh, chip package for your PCB? Yeah, yeah, it's like, oh, that was the day I learned the difference between SOP and SOIC. <laughs> Had I seen it on a board or next to a computer, I would have known. So in 2002, I said, OK, I'm going to get a piece of canvas and take some, some better pictures. And it was me uh, with my pocket cam taking photographs. Uh, I really didn't know what I was doing. Four months later, it's amazing. When you're a student, you can borrow a lot of money. And <laughs> so four months later, uh, uh, they sent me, the federal government sent me an option to increase my student loans by $4,000. Don't tell them this. It's probably illegal. Um, but uh, I borrowed money from the federal government as a student loan. That money then went towards inventory. When you're starting your own business, there are no rules. There is no book that tells you how to do this stuff. You just sort of make it up as you go along. So that's what I did. And then uh, about nine months into it, my family came to me and said, Nate, you're always talking about your cash flow. Could we please help you out? Could we please give you some money? $750. Right? At that point in time, if you think about it, that's a huge portion of the initial funding. My parents and my family gave me $750, so my brother, my sister, and my mother each got a share in SparkFun. They each have about a half a percent of SparkFun. My father was very smart. He did not buy any shares in SparkFun, so he could tell me exactly what was on his mind. He could give me his opinion, and I wouldn't have to take it. Right? He's not a shareholder. I don't have to listen to him. He's a very wise man. So um, my brother, my sister, my mother uh, own a half a percent apiece, and then there's some other shares split up. I'm still 97% shareholder of SparkFun. So there are other ways to start a business other than venture capital. So here we are in Nate's bedroom, circa 2003. You can ship stuff. This is my bed. I don't know if you can tell, but that's my comforter and like my car keys. And that. This is tiny. I, this is me backed up against the far wall of the bedroom. Uh, so I emailed Olamex and I said, hey guys, the website is done. Would you please link from your... Uh, Olamex had a distributor's page. Would you please link from the distributor's page to SparkFun? Olamex said, wow, the website looks great. It spent two months putting it together, and they turned it on. 
And about seven hours after they turned on that link, I got an email that I had an order. I looked, I printed this order, I went, oh my goodness, I need boxes. <laughs> I had spent two months putting this thing together. I had inventory. I had failed to purchase boxes. So what do you do? You go to the university and there's lots of recycling bins. So for the first three months of SparkFun, I was dumpster diving behind the engineering center pulling out the recycled cardboard because I was too cheap to buy boxes. It works. Um, the third order was from France. This was where I realized that I had underestimated the, the demand. I thought I was going to be selling to my friends in Colorado, maybe some folks around the US. I don't know how to ship to France. So that morning you get that order and you go, well, you roll up your sleeves and you start looking at how to ship to a foreign country. Fifth order was for quantity of uh, three of something. That's interesting because I ordered one of everything from Olamex because I wasn't sure what was going to sell and what wouldn't. Well, shoot, I don't have enough to fill that order, so we got to deal with back orders. We've got to email the customer. Uh, email the customer and we need to figure out how to handle that. Um, I keep catching myself because I keep saying we. Um, we us, I'll talk to shipping. So that's the concept of making yourself look as big as you need to look or as small as you need to look. Uh, I'm in a bedroom, right? So somebody would call up, a customer would call up and say, hey SparkFun, I ordered three of these, you accidentally sent me only two of those. I say, oh no problem, I'll talk to customer service and make sure that order gets fixed. And then I'll talk to shipping and make sure this never happens again. <laughs> and then hang up the phone and fix whatever order I had messed up on my bed. So, it's, <laughs> From the beginning, SparkFun had to make ourselves sound bigger than what we really were, because, uh, see those little brown boxes? You guys have ordered from Amazon, right? You've ordered from DigiKey, and hopefully you've ordered from SparkFun. Um, when you get that little brown box on your front doorstep, does it matter if it came from a gigantic distribution center or if it came from somebody's bedroom? It doesn't really matter, as long as the stuff in the box is correct. But, if you knew you were ordering from some dude's bedroom, you probably wouldn't feel real good about that transaction. So we made ourselves sound like the royal we, when it was just me in a bedroom in the beginning. Now, of course, there's about 130, 135 employees, so there's lots of us, so now I can actually yell at shipping and they can yell at me. It's all good. Um, the applied for merchant account. So in 2002, it was actually a little bit difficult to accept credit cards. So what we had to do was apply for something called a merchant account, where um, you send them $100 in an application, and a couple days later, I got a FedEx envelope, a relatively thin FedEx envelope, and inside was a disposable camera. Do you guys even remember disposable cameras? Yeah. I can't believe they, they like, how weird. And so I'm, I'm like, okay, I've got a disposable camera. I trace back the fact that it's to the merchant account application. I call them up, I say, hey, I gave you $100, and I needed a merchant account. Why did you send me a disposable camera? And they said, well, we, need, uh, we have a problem with fraud. We have a problem with companies opening up charging 10,000 credit card numbers and then disappearing into the night. So what we need you to do with that disposable camera is take a picture of your inventory, take a picture of your shipping department so that we know that you have a legit, ship, legit shipping department, and a, a picture of the outside of your facility so that we know that you have a real facility. I said, well, ma'am, it's a picture of my bedroom, a picture of my bedroom, and a picture of the outside of my bedroom, and she said, that's fine. <laughs> Um, it was me. I, that was the, I, I don't know how fraudulent you had to look into those two. <laughs> um, so uh, now it's, of course, a lot easier. Anybody can hook up a payment system and charge credit card, whether it was Square or PayPal or anything else. Um, the moral of the story is that the, the night that we turned on credit card, uh, accept, the, the day that we could begin accepting credit cards, we doubled our sales. Right? If you make it easier for folks to spend money, if you make folks feel more comfortable with the transaction, not a bedroom, right? Uh, they're more likely to spend money at your shop. So make it easy, make it really easy to check out, um, and and the people will come your way. Uh, for, it, there's no, there's no secret to it, right? I didn't have some grand idea. I just made it easier to check out than digital, and that, it worked. So this is what SparkFun looked like years and years ago. Can you tell an electrical engineer designed it? <laughs> it's ugly. Right? It, 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 it hurts my eyes, uh, but it worked, right? The most important thing was that there was a picture and you could add it to your cart. Thank you, Wayback Machine. Right? This, is, this is how we get this. Um, of course, today, this is what it looks like. Everything that you'd expect, you can add it to your cart. You got nice uh, photographs and check out it's relatively easy, but it's taken us nine years to get here. Um, my problem is that Amazon is hurting all the small guys. Um, you shop with Amazon, they ship until like 8 or 9 p.m. 
right? And we have a lot of customers that say, well, smartphone Amazon can do it, why can't you? DigiKey can do it, why can't you? DigiKey did a billion and a half dollars worth of sales last year. They're something like a thousand times our size. We can't, so um, it, it works both ways. Uh, we look very big and legitimate, but on the back end, we're struggling to, to keep up uh, with customer expectations. If you guys have any kind of questions, please interrupt me at any point. I love to tell stories. <laughs> so if you have questions, uh, if you ever wondered what SparkFun does, it effectively sells shortcuts. Right, there's that chip, it's really cool, it's a pressure sensor. Uh, if you read the data sheet, we basically took their application circuit and stuck it on the PCB. But if you're a, a student, it could take you six or eight weeks to lay out that PCB, to, to solder that chip. You can actually hand solder that chip, surface mount is not that hard. You hook it all up, you write some code, you attach it to your microcontroller, and then when it doesn't work, was it my code, was it my soldering, or was it my PCB layout? It could take you weeks to get that thing working, or you could spend the 15 bucks at SparkFun and just get that thing running. Yes, ma'am? Um, how do you decide what to sell? Like, do you guys scout around for people just making these? And... It's uh, the, uh, perfect. Um, the, the way that we select new products is there's a group of engineers. Uh, in the beginning, it was me was saying, would I use this thing? Right? Or I'll build a project and realize that it's really difficult to connect to this specific connector, so let's carry that connector, or let's try to get around that barrier. So if I had that problem, I would carry it. Um, if we th think the technology is cool, or if we can design a project around this FM receiver, then that's the type of products that we carry. Uh, the logic analyzer this has saved my life so many times. Oh, this thing's awesome. It's 150 bucks. It's worth its weight in gold. Um, we didn't design it. Right, somebody else did. We found the company that is the best at making that widget, and we bring it in. So there's actually a split of about 2,000 products that we just resell, and 500 products that we design and manufacture in Boulder, Colorado. Okay, so we have an entire manufacturing line. We produce about 60,000 widgets a month. So there's a lot of people putting things together, and every single one of those boards has to be tested. So fully testing every board. Um, again, it's taken us nine years to get here. We didn't take this class in college. Um, <laughs> so how many of us have hooked up? Uh, um, Haha, I love it when I can do these presentations. See that thing over there? That's a motion sensor. Right? That is a motion sensor. It's like eight bucks. We all know what a microcontroller is, and that is a servo motor. So how many times have we hooked up and input a brain to an output? Right? Every engineer does this where they hook a, a sensor to a motor, big deal. It's the application of that technology that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Blender Defender. This gentleman had a problem with cats jumping up on his counter. And so what he did is he took a motion sensor, hooked it up to a microcontroller, and hooked it up to the servo. Servo just happened to be connected to the on button of a blender. And now the cats stay off the kitchen counter. <laughs> so realize that you know, it's never the technology. It's how you use it. It's how you apply it. So this gentleman was using a lot of our uh, cellular modules to track hawks and their progression across North America. This gentleman uh, emailed me, Mikey Schuyler, and said, thank you, SparkFun, for selling the ultrasonic distance sensor see image attached. And you open this up, and you're like, what in the world is he doing? Um, ultrasonic distance sensor went underneath the trampoline. This is out at Burning Man. And so uh, the distance sensor is hooked to a microcontroller. Uh, microcontroller just happened to be hooked to the valve on a propane tank. So the harder you jump, the distance to the ground is smaller, so the valve opens up more and the flame gets bigger. Will it ever be a consumer product? I hope so. <laughs> but it probably won't be, right? Blender Defender, same thing. It's, he had a specific problem. This gentleman had a specific problem. This person had a specific problem. We provide the, the, the bits and pieces to build the solution for whatever it is you're doing. It's, it doesn't have to be complicated. So a lot of our... Uh, uh, Content. A lot of people I talk to ask who we sell to, and uh, they say, well, you sell to the hobby market, right? Y yeah, we do. And then we get that order from NASA, or we get that uh, uh, P.O. box in Norfolk, Virginia, outside the CIA. It's really scary. Um, we don't know who we're selling to. Uh, it's obvious it's students like you, it's artists, it's teachers. Um, I, I learned a lot about geography when I started shipping boxes. Um, I'm pretty weird, I don't remember a lot of things. Uh, you know the state of Georgia. Um, so I printed the shipping label and I'm like, the Republic of Georgia. Where the heck? There's a country called Georgia. I have no idea. So um, we sell stuff all over the world. And so running this business has really opened my eyes to a lot of different things. Um, 
Of course, we uh, teach kids how to solder. This is at Maker Faire. A couple years ago, we taught eight or 900 kids how to solder. Uh, this stuff is getting simpler and simpler. This isn't just junior in college anymore. This isn't just high school anymore. This is, hey, I've got an eight-year-old. What have you got for me? And we can teach them to solder. We can teach them to program. We can teach them all sorts of stuff. Yeah, exactly. This is who makes up SparkFun. Uh, that's Cade, Joe, uh, Gordon, Tyler, Paul. Uh, Gordon is, was a bouncer at a bar, right? The, he, he didn't finish college, he doesn't have a degree. He's in a, a, like a heavy metal band. He's huge in Japan. I'm not kidding. <laughs> like, they fly him to Japan and he plays like crazy speed metal. It's incredible. And he's got tattoos all over. He's in customer service. He's the best phone representative ever. You don't know this until you give folks the chance. At SparkFun, it's not, what does your piece of paper say? It's, what have you done? Right? Oh, show me what you've built. And uh, we get some really fantastic employees, and it really improves the culture, right? I'd rather work with these guys any day of the week. It's kind of a hoot. Uh, Evan, he's big into Vikings. Uh, so this is production. <laughs> We've got uh, eight different departments, finance, Markom, engineering, production, operations, and engineering. And most recently, the Department of Education, we've got about 130 <coughs> people, and the average age is 27. Uh, the org chart is something, well, we'll talk about the timeline first. Um, that's me, way back in the beginning, 2003. Launched the site, had a merchant account, and then I graduated and moved into a house and hired my buddy. And you can see, it was one employee, two employee, 11, and we double. We almost double, we almost double. Do, 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 do. So we've been growing. Uh, revenue has been increasing. Last year we did 25 million in revenue. Um, you can see various spots along the way. We had order 300,000, uh, where order 100,000 was just two years before that. So our, our, we're increasing in speed. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Uh, what's the cease and desist for 2009? <laughs> that was a fun one. Uh, that was, uh, we got a cease and desist letter. There's, we've only had two legal entanglements in the nine years that we've been around. In 2009, we got a cease and desist letter from Spark International. That was shortly after Spark Fun filed for their trademark with the U.S. Patent and Trade Office, USPTO. So when you file for a trademark, it goes out to the public and say, hey, this company, SparkFun, is applying for this trademark. And there's another company called Spark International that tries to trade, Spark spelled with a C, by the way. Um, back in the 90s, Spark servers was the, what every, the internet ran on. And then they sort of disappeared, and now they're kind of coming back through Oracle. I'm not really sure. No. Um, spark spelled with a C. So any word spark, S-P-A-R-K or S-P-A-R-C, they would send cease and desist letters to. A dozen at a time. Just kick them out. So we got the cease and desist letter that said, hey, you have to shut down SparkFun right now and give it to us. And so what we did is we put it on the homepage and said, hey, public, what do you think about this? And the great thing was is that uh, Spark International is owned by Sun and we have customers at Sun. <laughs> so we actually got into some, like the, the, our customers were emailing higher ups at Sun being like, what are you doing like that? So it was a nice, uh, it was a very good David and Goliath situation. So in the end, we signed a coexistence agreement with Spark International that says uh, they agree not to sue us and we agree not to build giant servers. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yes. Uh, well what was the site hacked for you? Who did that? That was pretty evil as well. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, really stressful that day. 2007 in February, um, the, the website was up and I was kind of on it. Uh, there was 10 or 12 of us in the office at this time. So at this point, I was the one kind of uh, butchering the HTML and trying to keep the server up and running. Uh, so 2007, I'm on the SparkFun website. I type something into the search box, hit search, and some something glitches and I end up over on this soccer website. I don't know, something must be wrong, I'm not sure what. A couple hours later, we get some emails from some customers saying, hey, I think your site's been, um, not taken over, but modified, but it's been hacked. And we sort of look into it, and what happened is, um, there was a zero-day vulnerability through the PHBB forum. We ran a support forum, and I hadn't installed the updates for like a year or two. And so somebody got root access to our servers and modified the search buttons to redirect. So every time the traffic got redirected to the soccer website, somebody got a nickel. But it, it, wasn't, it wasn't bad. Um, so we, we tore all that out, we changed a bunch of passwords, we sort of got control of the servers back. Um, but what really stung us was um, we had some plain text credit cards in a table that was password protected. 
if you knew where to look and how to get to it, you could potentially get to these credit cards. We needed to keep them on hand for back orders. Right, if you have a back order, you need to charge it. So we had some credit card numbers, so we let our customers know. There was about 400 customers that we emailed saying, hey, just be sure. We don't think the credit card numbers got out, but just in case, watch your account and make sure that nothing happened. Well, then Visa found out. Visa then threatened $150,000 for the fines. If they have to reissue a whole bunch of credit cards, and uh, take they, uh, the person who takes the credit cards is responsible. So it's really, really hairy business. Uh, it's all about PCI compliance and all the rest. So it was a really stressful month. We had to go through an audit, spend a bunch of money. In the end, it cost us about $12,000. But that day was the day I realized I needed IT. <laughs> right? But, but think about it. You, if you're thinking about starting your own company, do you hire IT day one? No, you, you hack it together, you kick it together, and you, you fake it until, you know, you realize, okay, now five years into it, I guess I need to hire my friend Chris so that he can, you know, keep track of the servers and make sure everything's good. So it's painful, but powerful lesson. <laughs> Analytics. Um, we sell uh, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. during the regular weekday, <coughs> time adjusted to the local time zone. Uh, we sell all over the world, we get hits even from Libya, and you can see there's four spikes there, right? So we're going to call it spike A, B, C, and D. Um, if you guys, you guys want to guess what the spikes are? If you know any, this is like 2009, 2010, history of smartphone, no, okay. Free uh, yes, which spike is free day? A, B, C, or D? Don't know, okay, so spike A is the cease and desist. It's a whole lot of comments, a whole, I mean, we had read it, we had people vehement about, uh, it was crazy. Spike B is the announcement of free day. That second spike, the th just the announcement of free money generated more traffic than what could le potentially legally kill us. It's amazing. Spike C is free day number one. Okay, spike D is free day number two. Look at the dip right before free day number two. <laughs> you, you, you laugh, but that's, that's actually the slowest time of year for us. That's the week of Christmas. We do absolutely no business leading up to Christmas. Why? We think because all the geeks have to hang out with their family. <laughs> they can't be on the internet building stuff. They can't be buying stuff. They've they got to hang out with their family. So um, it's very slow for us, and then of course we have free day, and uh, the, the traffic is off the charts. This, a fun. Uh, this is the org chart. Uh, that's me. Uh, and this grew very organically. This is uh, finance. This is education. This is IT. This is inventory. Um, uh, that's Trevor. He's my COO. He's in the audience. He runs. This is all customer service and shipping. Up above him is Matt. That's production. Pete is engineering. And uh, Andrea is marketing and communication. So um, what you get from this is that it's just crazy, right? It's very organic. It didn't start this way. It grew randomly in wherever we needed people. Yes, sir. Out of curiosity, do you actually track the, the where the page visits are uh, leading up to free day to kind of anticipate the free day orders? Interesting question. I I'm sure we have that data in analytics, but we aren't looking at it that closely. Um, and it, because Free Day has changed its style uh, the previous years, it's it's a little different every year. Uh, but you get slammed though on, on, on Free Day if you don't anticipate the non inventory of certain things. Then composition it, right here. It's madness. Um, the, uh, if you don't know what Free Day is, the first Free Day was the concept that I really hate um, difficult things. So Free Day was the idea that anybody could come to our web shop and get hundred dollars worth of free stuff. You pay for shipping, which is like five to seven dollars, and you can have. Whatever you want, right? First come, first serve, we're going to give away $100,000. Well, unfortunately, this generated so much traffic that, of course, it locks up the server and does all sorts of bad things. But that's um, really helped us fix all of our infrastructure and really you know, show IT that we need to like, be ready to scale, guys. So it's, uh, Free Day was a huge test of the IT infrastructure. Uh, but the, in, another interesting thing about this is uh, the red bit there is engineering. There's about 10 to 13 engineers. So out of an entire technology company, it's 10% engineers. For every red box that we come up with that we need to ship, it's one engineer that has a good idea and nine people to get it out the door. There's a lot of different pieces to a company to make it work. So if you're thinking about an engineering company, it's, it's not all engineers, for sure. 
I didn't go to business school, but I, they tell me it's supposed to be up and to the right. <laughs> uh, monthly revenue, uh, this is you know, 2005, this is March of 2012, a couple months ago. Um, it's about two million per month, two and a half million per month. So things are good, um, we're just struggling to keep everything in stock and keep everything moving. As long as we can ship some little red boxes, things are good. Ah, we, we knew this was, was coming, but if 50% uh, of our revenue is domestic, 50% of our revenue is international. And you look at it, um, the, the side scale is kind of weird, it's 44 to 56%, so it's not that dramatic, but we've sort of been headed towards a convergence point, and we see it kind of sticking there. So uh, that's the way it's going to be for the next uh, couple years probably. And then if you think, uh, what, where do we ship the most stuff? We ship it to Canada, Japan, and all over Europe, and 128 other countries. So we're shipping to about 140 countries in the world. It's kind of crazy. Think about it. Whenever you turn on that website, you're instantly global. Whether you like it or not, you can be found all over the world. Well, maybe not China and North Korea and a couple other places. But um, <laughs> you, you, you know, you, the vast majority of countries can find you. And you can do businesses if you get a buy it now button next to it. I found this really interesting. I started tracking this uh, back to 2008. So if you take the... Uh, uh, dollars per click. So if you take the revenue, $2 million a month, and you take the number of site visits to SparkFun, and you divide the two, you say dollars per visit. It's very, very flat, meaning as we add more traffic, we add more revenue. It's very linearly related. We aren't seeing a change. We aren't losing rev. We aren't adding extra eyeballs and not seeing revenue connected to that. It's, it's kind of crazy. Um, the next time you load SparkFun.com, this means you give me a buck seventy-five. <laughs> Every single time somebody visits sparkfun.com, it's a buck seventy-five. I mean, not really, but it's um, it's something like if, if two million visits and we had five. Uh, sorry, sorry, two million dollars and five hundred thousand visits. That's two dollars per visit. <coughs> not every single one of those visitors are buying something. But on average, it's a buck seventy-five. That's incredible. So every time we can do a homepage post that draw, draw more people to the website, that's added revenue. It's very linearly related. So I, I'm, I'm a craft guy. Um, okay, so lessons and the things I've learned over the past couple of years. Uh, that's me, Halloween, a couple of years ago. I was a stoplight. Uh, it, it, um, it actually lit up, so I was red, then it would go yellow. Sorry, it was green, then it would go yellow, then it would go red, and then it would cycle. And um, I was a customer, right? I bought stuff from SparkFun, hooked it all up, and realize that, you know what, it's uh, these connectors need to be this way, and I discovered that this product works really well, but this product doesn't work really well, so maybe we need to change that. If the CEO doesn't drink his own Kool-Aid, things are bad. I use, I'm a number one super customer. I, I love our stuff, right? So every day I'm using it and evaluating and giving feedback. That's really, really important, I think, to a company. And for me, um, if you talked to me four years ago and somebody said the word financials, huh? I, I wouldn't know what you were talking about, but over the past four years, I've had to learn the hard way what these financial documents mean because this is what bankers talk. And every once in a while, I need a loan from a bank, so I needed to know what financials work. So you need to always work on you if you're going to start a business. It doesn't have to be all the time, but it helps. And yes, sir. So before you go too far away from your your uh, revenue numbers, yeah. Um, so. Clearly, your, your main customer is the, the hobbyist that doesn't want to make their own service model PCB and they want to do cool stuff with these things. But you, you have your own Eagle PCB layouts on most of these, these reference designs. Have you actually started encountering any competition going in essentially taking your designs, your company's designs, and then reselling them themselves? Absolutely. Um, there's been four or five instances um, of it, you search eBay. And um, you'll find all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, Alibaba is also a really good place to find the SparkFun Flame on some interesting PCBs. Um, they've combined all sorts of stuff. Uh, but those are, those are counterfeiters, copycats, uh, whatever it is. As long as they post the Eagle files and maintain the license, it's awesome. It's open source hardware, go crazy. That's what we want to see more of. Um, there's a couple companies um, I know Fry's was doing some really questionable stuff, but we kind of got them corrected and go in the right direction. Um, as long as they're uh, publishing editable source files, I think we're okay. Um, I personally don't have the time or the want to go after a company with a cease and desist or something else. That's really just a distraction to more innovation. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, cool. Uh, so, if you're going to start your own business, uh, if you have, have you guys started your own businesses here? Anybody start their own business? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Excellent. Um, as you went along, did you take enough photographs? Right. I, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I highly recommend if you're going to start your own business or if you're doing something, <clears throat> grab a camera and just take some random shots. Right. They don't have to be candid, but they're that snapshot that moment in time that's going to be really important later. So this is a picture of me at like the first conference in Seattle. I was so young I couldn't rent a car. Right? And you have to be 25 to rent a car. And so I'm really glad that somebody took this photograph. It's the old SparkFun logo. It's me you know, in like jeans and a polo. And uh, this was like you know our products at the time. It was so simple and sad, but it was really important that we got that photograph because this is what our booth looks like. Right? It's madness. It's 23 people and this gigantic thing and all this going on. So as you go, take photos of your people. This was the first uh, SparkFun party. There's me and Trevor and Paul in customer service and a bunch of friends um, from various places that are still at SparkFun. Um, this is a, a bar in Boulder that we're actually not allowed to go back to. Um, <laughs> so you kind of got to take that photo to be like, oh, we were there. This is how big we were once because eventually you're going to turn into something much, much bigger. And you want to remember those lessons and remember those moments in time. So grab a photograph, uh, grab a camera and take some photos. So working for you, this is the basement of the rental house that we were operating out of for about a year, year and a half. Uh, if you start your own company, it's that long hours and can be really high stress. When Visa threatened us with 150,000, oh my god, that, week, that month was horrible. Uh, low pay. So I graduated college and was told, brainwashed from the beginning, that electrical engineers get $63,000 a year after graduating. <laughs> that's not really true, but um, that's what they told us when we when we signed up, right? But um, when I graduated, I didn't get anything. I didn't get a paycheck. I had spark fun. It could barely keep the lights on. My friends went to work for antenna design companies, or for defense contractors, or for big silicon manufacturers. They got real paychecks. They got that sixty-three or seventy or eighty thousand dollars a year. Okay, year number two, they got that seven to ten percent bump. Year three, seven to ten percent bump. They really do pretty good. Well, me in the background. I barely had enough money to buy a winter jacket. I remember, year number three, I had enough money to buy a, a down jacket. That's a big deal in Colorado, right? <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of, not here. You don't need a down jacket here. But there in Colorado, it's a big deal. Um, now, the, the, the difference is that they have a ceiling. They're going to plateau pretty quickly, where if a business can take off, I'm now, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm really lucky to have Spark and things are going well, but it was a big gamble. Um, unsteady work, you don't know what orders you're going to have that day, and when the server breaks, or the printer doesn't print, or something goes wrong, you don't get to call anybody. You get to roll up your sleeves and try to fix whatever it is that's broken. Of course, the pros, I have a ton of fun doing what I do. I get to be my own boss. I get the two-minute commute. I wake up in the bedroom upstairs, grab a cup of coffee, and walk down to the basement and start filling orders or start building whatever it is we need for that day. And of course, it's a creative freedom. I get to choose. That's the biggest deal to me. I get to choose what I want to work on that day. Whether it's a new wireless chip or a new design or a new enclosure, it's that, that's a lot of fun for me. That's the most important part. So don't believe that um, you can't do it. If somebody, well, I had a lot of people tell me that my business plan was silly. Right? You can't ship stuff out of your bedroom. Well, you kind of can. <laughs> Don't listen to them. Um, you want to create a company like you would want to work there. So this is this is Spark Fun. This is the production floor before we moved all the stuff in. Um, we've got 140 people and 41 dogs. <laughs> 41 dogs. That's incredible. Out of those 41 dogs, there's about 20 to 25 that come every day, and they they do all sorts of stuff. But it's great. I don't I don't have a dog. I'm not a dog person, but I like working around people. <laughs> right? It, it's, it's cool. It's kind of fun to pet them and then, you know, they go away. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I created an environment that I wanted to work in. Um, I did, dress code? Why is there a dress code? I want to wear jeans to work. I want to do these different things. Dogs, skateboards. If uh, I never worked in a real company, so it was kind of nice because I didn't have those kind of preconceived notions of what a company should be. Uh, this is about open source hardware. So if you don't know, SparkFun builds that board. It's called the Arduino Fio, and we posted that uh, along with the design files. And about 12 weeks later, this board was made 
by Seed Studio. Seed Studio is based out of Shenzhen, China. And uh, so when I, over, I went over there a couple years ago, I met with Eric Pan. Eric Pan is the guy that runs Seed. So um, this is open source hardware in action. It's fantastic. He took our design files and said, you know what, that's pretty cool, but you guys use this slide switch that breaks really easy, so we're going to replace it with this other slide switch. And your reset switch isn't tall enough, so we're going to do a better reset switch. So when my engineers first looked at this, they were in a panic. They said, oh my god, we've been copied. I said, no guys, it's okay. Eric did exactly right. He took our design files, made the design better, and published those design files. So what did we do? We said, awesome, we're going to take his design files <laughs> and make it a little better and improve the FIO. So what this does is it makes it really, really fast. You've got 12 weeks to sell the heck out of whatever product you've got before somebody comes along and makes it better and takes all your sales. Okay, so you've got to constantly innovate. This is, a, this is not a bad thing. This is a great market business driver. So my engineers are always trying to come up with the next thing. You've got 12 weeks. Are you going to improve it? Are you going to make it better? Are you going to differentiate yourself? Patents, I believe, make people sit on their laurels. Right? If you've got a patent, you can spend years with a war chest of money going after people, fighting it. Why not spend all that time and energy innovating? So that's why we do open source everything. All 450, 500 of our products, you can download the Gerbers and copy. Smartphone, absolutely. <coughs> but it, uh, it's a race, and uh, it keeps us moving pretty fast. So it's good stuff. So it's never the technology. It's how you use it, right? Whether it's the Blender Defender or something else crazy. Um, if you're going to start a business and you aren't really into that business, I didn't start a farm, right? I'm not, I don't know how to farm. I'm not into milking cows. I don't know how to do it. I started an electronics company because I'm really into it. I really enjoy this stuff. So make sure that whatever you start aligns with what you enjoy doing. Otherwise, it's really going to be work. And I see a lot of customer, uh, sorry, um, engineering projects where they say, hey, I have this thing and it has all these features. The iPhone is a great example. You look at the iPhone, you can pull up maps, you can listen to music, you can text. It, it's a cell phone. Does it make a good call? No. No. It, 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 does all, it has all these features, but it doesn't do one thing well. Okay, so whatever product you build, do one thing well and all forget all the other stuff. A lot of the SparkFun products are very, very simplistic that way. Um, Get it for sale as soon as possible. That's the buy it now button. If, if there are tweaks, if you know the red wires on PCBs, if you mess up a trace, you can cut the trace and then wire. I've sold stuff like that, right? If, as long as you take a picture and tell folks this is exactly what you're going to get, it does A, B, it doesn't do C or D, they're fine with that, right? If it's, it's a, here's my widget for 20 bucks. If you want to buy it, you can. Um, get it available for sale as quick as you can. Every day you're going to learn something new. The IRS is going to send you lots and lots of forms. And you're not going to know what those forms mean. But every day you get a new form from the IRS, you're going to learn how to deal with it. So, uh, yeah, you can't take the class. And um, don't worry about the details, right? Just launch it and uh, see where you go with it. Um, I wrote a business plan for SparkFun, right? I had a business plan for dummies. And within about four or five months of running SparkFun, the business plan sort of, I had planned to go this way, and the, I saw the business taking me this way. So after about four months, the business plan didn't apply anymore. You gotta go with it, you gotta see where the market's gonna take you, and you won't know until you really start it and start running with it. So, that's pretty much it. I've also got some other stuff on the SparkFun website that I'd love to tell you about and um, show you, but this is the rotary phone from years and years ago. If you guys haven't seen this, uh, in 2007, I tore out the inside of a, of a rotary phone, put in a cellular module and some batteries, and walked around with a rotary phone. You can actually <laughs> dial out <laughs> from that anywhere in the world. You can also receive phone calls from anywhere in the world. It was completely silly, but I got written up in the New York Times. It was great. I could take to my mom and say, hey, look. This, this is actually <laughs> so I am going to try get... Yes, sir. What happened to the Wi-Fi Shield? I don't know. What happened to the Wi-Fi Shield? Uh, it's. I know it's still available for sale. What says retired on your website? Oh yeah, yeah. So we get. Uh, and the library never worked. Agreed. <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. 
couple things. Uh, the the Wi-Fi shield was effectively a breakout for the roving network's uh, uh, Wi-Fi module. Uh, it was difficult to use. Um, the, the purpose of SparkFun is to really take those uh, barriers and make them easier. So we didn't do a very good job on it. However, I would argue that we took it at least a couple steps in the right direction. Previous to the, the Wi-Fi shield, you couldn't, it was a surface mount module. There was no breakout board for it. So we got the breakout board, we tried to get the software running, didn't work, um, the work on it. Um, and um, just saw, did you, were you guys at Maker Faire? Uh, yeah, uh, do you see electric imp? Yeah, yeah. This, <laughs> um, the Wi-Fi shield is going to get blown away completely by a $25 SD card sized Wi-Fi module. It's yeah, it's amazing. So um, everybody has the, those issues, and they're they're kind of fixing them. But um, okay, the problem with uh, let's see what I can do. Um, I can do. Are there other questions? Can you tell us about the time you bought a bunch of slugs that were microprocessors? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so. Uh, In 2008, uh, wait, 2009? December, December of 2009, there was a worldwide shortage of this processor. This processor goes on like every Arduino known to mankind. It's the AT Mega 328. Um, so uh, there was a shortage coming, we couldn't get them, and so we talked to all the radio guys. Did you keep? And I don't know if you're aware of, of course, Mauser, and then there's also some bigger ones called Future, Aero Electronics, you know, big component suppliers. We hit them up, they had no stock either, so we extended even further. We said, hey, anybody, and we found some vendors in China. And we're, we said, well, we buy um, basic things from China, but we don't buy integrated circuits from China. We've never done it, so we kind of knew that we were getting on the thin ice. And it was kind of an interesting deal. Um, basically, we, we bought a reel of 2,000 ATMA, and we paid two or three bucks a piece, so it's $6,000. We get these things in, and I'm like, hey, I, I don't know about these, but um, we should... Uh, we should check and see if they work. And so on the left is a real AT Mega 328, on the right is a fake one. So they went so so uh, so far as to sand down the tops and relabel them with a laser. Does that make sense? Um, it, there's there's a whole long thing about um, opening them up and um, finding out what's inside. And eventually, I'll cut to the chase. It was really hard to tell the difference, um, but the the final part is. Um, Really oddly, we found out that uh, we had a guy on staff whose dad worked at Atmel Failure Analysis Labs. So we took one of the fake chips to Atmel, and they dissolved the top of it. And underneath, we found um, it was an on semiconductor part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, you can get anything in China. <laughs> right? <laughs> what do you want it to say? Uh, what do you want the chip to be? Um, so we kind of knew that we were uh, really, we were getting into a gray zone, and uh, we weren't too surprised when we got counted the parts. But uh, lesson learned. Mm, cool. Um, other fun lessons. Uh, I told you about the uh, first uh, legal entanglement. The second legal entanglement was when we got a subpoena about a month ago. Um, this is what a subpoena looks like. It's like a Word doc, a template that somebody edited, filled in a bunch of stuff, and added an image to their Word document, then emailed it to us. So the point here is that I thought subpoenas on TV were these like folded blue things, right, that somebody hands you, right? That's that, the, the, when you get served, that's what they give you. Well, actually, the way that the, the law works is uh, some detective, some investigator out there can send you an email with a PDF attachment, and that is a subpoena, and that can compel you to turn over data. Okay, so we talked to this investigator, and they were asking for a couple hundred records. Can you see where it says, like, SPRAC fun? They, they missed, yes, uh, the sheriff's <laughs> office and SPRAC fun employees. They didn't even, like, work, uh, e um, yeah, typo check the, the document they were creating. It's completely silly. Um, so we talked to our attorney, and they said, yes, you actually do need to turn over these records. Um, my point is, is that you can fight this stuff. You don't need to give over records. I'm really, really sensitive about giving out customer data. So... Uh, legal stuff. You learn about it every day. If you get yes, sir. 
the top, top drivers of innovation in your company, innovation of the stuff that you that you guys make? What are the top drivers? Yeah, top drivers. So you're saying open source. What, how about customer? Do you get much innovation from like customer feedback? Like, oh, it'd be really cool if you could build this or that. Or like, yeah. How do you how do you keep? Uh, so somebody will come to us and say, hey, I built this crazy thing, um, but I have a full-time job. Would you please help me make this thing? I don't want to do order fulfillment. I don't have a pick-and-place machine. Please help me build this thing. So Jay Silver of MIT Media Labs and Eric uh, Rosen, Rosenbaum uh, came, up, came up with this thing called Makey Makey and pitched it to uh, me and a couple other people. And it's this awesome thing. And we said, oh, that's kind of neat. Yeah, maybe we should sell that. And they wanted to do a Kickstarter. So we agreed to be the manufacturer. Um, uh, one of our engineers helped them design the board. And then, so the idea came from a customer. The idea came from the community. And then we teamed up and collaborated with them to create this product. And Kickstarter's ridiculous. This is getting out of control. Um, we, we thought that if we could build 300 of these boards, it was a good thing. 500 boards would be a home run. We are eight days into it, and we've got 4,000 backers. That means basically 4,000 boards that we're going to need to build. So Kickstarter is a whole weird way to pre-sell products. With this one, will you do an open source ship? Uh, it already is. Yeah, uh, I think the files are up on GitHub already, which poses an interesting problem. Um, if our competitors see this, they could potentially start shipping Makey Makeys before our Kickstarter is even over. Yeah. I don't know. Sold for that. But we but we haven't built. We've got 22 days before we get the money, and before the pick and place machines start running. But our competitors could see how well it's sold, and download the GitHub files and start producing them right now. Crazy. Yes, sir. What are you most excited about going forward, and what are your what's your vision for the future? Where do you go? From? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> education. Uh, so, at junior senior year of college is when I uh, was shown how to use a UV erasable flash microcontroller. Right? I had, it was 2004. Why am I learning microcontrollers in 2004, especially UV erasable microcontrollers? Right? There are so many other tools out there, and it's getting easier and easier. So in education, um, SparkFun is taking our products, packaging it in a way that we can now teach 10th and 11th graders. Imagine if you learned this stuff, not in, not in physics class, not in you know, some specific programming course, but in like a random art class. If you were a 10th grade and you learned how to make linky things and make noise and react to inputs and make blender defenders or you know, flames jump, that's what we should be teaching kids. How much more successful are they going to be in college? Yeah. One of the other things, uh, did, did you guys have a TI calculator at some point in your life? <laughs> do, you, do you have, like, I still have mine. <laughs> it's the TI-86. I keep the batteries in it, like fresh, like working. And I have this real personal relationship with my calculator, as I did when I first got it in 7th or 8th grade. I want SparkFun to become that brand, that company, so that you have that personal relationship that, TI, that I had with TI and my calculator. That was really cool. So I'm hoping to get, sort of change the education. Yes, sir. Did you ever consider seriously like giving up at any point? And what made you get through those times if there were <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, it was. It was. Oh, um, was there any points on the timeline that I ever thought about giving up? Um, no. Um, what? That's a really good question. Um, I don't think I ever had thoughts of giving up. There was some really high stress times. Um, running and boxing helps, right? <laughs> Physical, I, you got it. You got to work out the stress somehow. Um, and what helped me get through those points? Yeah, just physical workout, or um, it, it always helped that uh, at least we were growing. I think a true challenge of a manager is not when times are good, right? The test of our team is not now. The test of our team will be whenever it plateaus or whenever it starts to go down. Yes, sir. You said you're getting into education. This is like a strange question. There's a project here on campus which is called Spark Lab, Spark Truck, which is like. Oh, I know Spark Truck well. Are you going to send them a season? Is this, is this because it's Spark something? Can, can I show you guys the logo? Yeah. <laughs> um, if you guys know anybody at the design school, it'd be great if you guys could talk to 
Um, I've talked to Jason. Jason uh, runs the. Um, does the does yeah, that look, sure. What about the? Oh, does that not look like Spark on Spark Fun? Okay. Here, let me let me do a side by side. It's it's like. So, so, right? so, yeah, so we're just like, you know, a lot of that's, people that's fine. Um, the, the, the five people that came to our booth and said, oh, hey, what are you guys doing with the truck out front? That's where I have a problem. Um, so I did talk to Jason, and, and we're working on a deal. We're not going to send him a cease and desist, because that's not the way I operate. That's um, a waste of energy and resources, in my opinion. But it does kind of show um, that there can be confusion in the market. So um, I'm learning a lot about trademark. That, that's how it goes. Uh, yeah, so their Spark truck is doing awesome stuff. They've got this big truck that they're driving across California, and wherever they stop, it's sort of like a on-the-go hacker space. And so they bring kids in and show them how to build stuff. And so what they're doing is awesome. Um, it's just we got to work out so that there's less confusion that that is Spark fun. Spark truck. Okay. It also gets five miles to the gallon, which is hilarious. <laughs> like, that, they're going to drive to Aspen. And I'm like, how are you guys going to do it? Yes, sir. On uh, all the product pages, there's tons and tons of comments in, in the forums too. How much do you pay attention to those when there's uh, a lot of people, say, complaining about a particular product, saying, oh, you did this wrong, um, you know, you should hook it up like this? It, um, it goes both ways. So um, tech support has to cover emails, phone calls, Facebook, Twitter, uh, comments on the website, Physical mail, it's, there's a lot coming in, and we monitor all those comments and all of that data. Um, and it has to hit a tipping point. There's a lot of folks that, you know, we have pretty, we have actually have a very high comment uh, quality. You ever look at the comments on YouTube? <laughs> um, comments on Sparkfun are actually pretty good, so we take them all very seriously, um, and we've been proven wrong a couple times. Where it's just like, whoa, we're sorry, we're gonna fix that. Um, we, so it is a great indicator. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, it's uh, tech support monitors those, and then that'll bubble up to engineering once a week, and the engineers sort of fix stuff as we go. Cool. Any other questions? Great. Well, um, if yes, yes, sir. Uh, what percent of the employees you hired at the beginning were people you knew from school, and like, how did you go about building the actual company? We tried to make like the interconnections of how everybody knew each other. Um, uh, uh, let's see, I hired uh, the guy that I sat down next to freshman year of Circuits 1, right? That was Pete. I sat down next to Pete, and Pete is now the director of engineering. Uh, Pete had uh, a wife who had a sister, and um, she was getting married to a guy named Trevor. And so then I hired Trevor. And then um, uh, I had a guy who I used to row with, and he had a sister who was looking for a job, and so I hired Jordan. Um, it's all just super connected. And then when our friend group wasn't big enough, I did exactly what they told me not to do, and that's hire friend and, and family. My brother worked for me for a year. That was cool. That worked out. Um, so uh, we extended the friend group as much as possible because you're most likely to enjoy working with folks that have the same worldview. Uh, when that wasn't big enough, Craigslist kicked in. And then we hired um, Andy, Andrew Lance, and Andy had, uh, he went to a, um, a technical school and had all these friends, and so he was like, he had all these friends that we hired. So that's how we know each other. Cool. Uh, if there's any other questions, please grab me afterwards. I bet you guys have other places to be, so thank you very much for coming.